looking at John chapter 20. Near the end of John's record of the life of Jesus, I suppose these words are familiar to most of us. But they have a context that is important for us to understand. Jesus said, or John wrote, John wrote that Jesus did other signs, that is, miracles, which are not written in this book, but he gave a reason for writing those that he did. He said, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. The miracles that Jesus did were given for the purpose of inducing our faith in Him. We should believe that He is the Son of God. You might remember that in chapter 3 of the book of John, we read of Nicodemus coming to Jesus, and he said, Master, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Why do we know that? Because nobody can do the things you're doing unless God is with him. In Hebrews chapter 2, in the first four verses, the Hebrew writer uh, speaks to us, reminding us of the things that Jesus came teaching and then said the apostles followed after him teaching those same things. And then he says in verse number 4 that God himself was bearing them witness by the signs and miracles that he did through their hands. So the miracles that Jesus did were the, for the purpose of proving to us that he is the Son of God. Many people today teach other purposes for the miracles, but that's what God said that they were for. Sometimes people today want to see more miracles. Miracles are exciting. It's amazing to see somebody walking on water, raising the dead, healing the sick of all manner of afflictions at just a touch or maybe even just spoken from a distance, from another town far away. These things all happened when Jesus was in this world uh, walking among men and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 1, the second book, uh, the, the, the following book after the book of John, tells us in verse number 1 of all that Jesus began both to do and to to teach. It's interesting that John mentioned the deeds of Jesus before the teaching of Jesus. It's true as we look through the record of Jesus that much of what he taught was possible because of the miracles that he did. The miracles drew people to him. That was their purpose. They were signs pointing to something. Pointing to the fact that here's somebody who's different. Here's somebody in fact who is the Son of God. His deeds and His words are evidence of His deity. And His deity is His power to save all who will follow after Him. It will look then through the preaching and teaching of the New Testament. We can learn, number one, about the miracles that He did, and number two, about the impact and effect. Look and see what the apostles preached regarding the miracles of Jesus. Not the miracles they did or that God did through them, but the miracles that, or the, excuse me, the preaching that they did concerning the miracles of Jesus. In John, excuse me, in Acts chapter 5 and in verse number 42, Luke tells us that daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. What do you preach when you preach Jesus Christ? Well, Luke has already told us in verse 1 of this epistle that uh, he spoke of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. What he did, what he taught. People today all over the world are thinking about a baby in a manger. That's not what's significant about Jesus. Babies are cute. Everybody likes to cuddle a baby and ooh and ah when they see the baby pictures. And oh, that's great. That's a good thing. That's, you know, that's how God made us. That's not what Jesus is all about. Jesus is all about what he taught. Not the miracles that he did. The miracles pointed to 
his teaching. When they went to pre preach and teach Jesus Christ, they told about his life. Paul, when he came to Athens in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, we read that he preached to them, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. He talked about the miracles. He talked about how Jesus endured the suffering, and there's some miracle involved in that. Now, some of the things that he tolerated, some of the things he put up with without as the scripture says, casting the same in his teeth um, without turning and reviling again, as we uh, are so often tempted to do. Uh, he, he tolerated that. But then after they put him to death, he rose from the dead. But Paul says, all of that, having, having spoken of that, here's the conclusion. This is the Christ. What's the word Christ mean? It means the anointed one, the one chosen and designated by God to be the Savior of the world. Him whose message we should hear in order to know how to get into heaven. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read that God used to speak to people through prophets in the Old Testament times, but now today He speaks to us through Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. And Peter says that we have in Jesus all things that pertain to life and godliness when we study and learn and understand who he is uh, then we have all that we need to know in order to live godly in this world and to find eternal life when this world is finished and so we need to understand the teaching of jesus but the miracles were given to point to the teaching of jesus so that we would know that when his when we hear his teaching we know that is the truth of God, just as Nicodemus said that he and some others in his day were already recognizing. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus himself is recorded as having said, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. It's that important. We have to know who Jesus is. John said, uh, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. When Jesus said, I am he, what specifically did he mean? He was referring to the Old Testament uh, comments of, um, of uh, Moses in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 18, that God was going to raise up a prophet to uh, come after Moses so that people would listen not to Moses any longer, but to the new prophet who was to come. That's Jesus. When John the baptizer came preaching, people said, are you that prophet? He said, no, I'm not. There's one coming after me. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. When he comes, listen to him. Jesus is the one. In uh, the end of his life, as recorded by Mark in chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he told his disciples, his, his apostles, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be damned or condemned. Jesus was very specific. If we don't believe in him, that he is from God, that he is the designated one, the chosen one of God to bring salvation into the world, and then if we don't believe his words and do what he said, then we have no salvation from God. We're still in our sins. Sin separates us from God. We are lost from heaven. We have no real hope ever of being in heaven but are bound for the punishment that is due to all of those who refuse to honor and glorify God. Paul, the apostle, in, uh, writing back to the church in Corinth where he spent much time, had this to say to them in chapter 15 of his first epistle in the first four verses. I declare unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you. Jesus had told the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What's the gospel? Here's what Paul said about it. Uh, I preach the gospel by which you are saved, verse 2, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed it in vain. That means to believe it and then stop believing in it. Believing in it but not really living accordingly. If you follow that path, then you don't have any hope in God. But if you listen to what I said, Paul writes, and you believed it, and you continue in it, here's what he said. You're going to have salvation. It's what saves you. 
Here's what I delivered to you, verse number 3. I delivered to you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. We're going after this lesson immediately to uh, remember, according to the instructions of the Lord Himself, His death. His death is important for us. He paid the price for our sins. Well, that's really good. But it doesn't do us any benefit if we don't acknowledge it and take advantage of it. I might come along and, you know, you might receive a, a bill in the mail and you might be complaining, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this bill. And I might come along and say, here, let me just pay it for you. And, I, you know, I've offered to pay it and the payment is there. I might even send it into the company and the payment has been made. But if you would be so foolish as to keep on making the monthly payments, it didn't do you any good, did it? You didn't benefit from it. I might go buy you a, I don't know, a new car. And if you just let it sit on the dealer's lot, it doesn't do you any good. You've got to take advantage of the benefit that somebody else gave to you. Jesus came and paid the price for your sins, which separated you from God. And you can be reunited with God, not just because He died on the cross, but because you recognize that He is the Son of God, and you took the steps that give you the benefit from His uh, sacrifice, from His payment. You took the keys and you started up the car, you know, or whatever. You took the money you might have been paying for that bill and went and bought the groceries that the family needed, something on that, or whatever. You've got to take advantage of the benefit. And he gives us that specific instruction how to do that. Paul says that he died for us, and then he said he was buried. There's, you know, proof that he was, in fact, dead. And then he rose from the dead. We can see Jesus on the cross and not see our salvation. We can see Jesus on the cross and not see any necessity of response from us at all, other than we might be tearful at such suffering. But when we see Jesus rising from the dead, then we can see an amazing benefit to ourselves. We can see this man truly is the Son of God. You know, the centurion said that when Jesus died. But when he rose again, the whole world can know that here is the Son of God. Oh, other people had come back from the dead. Jesus had called them back from the dead. Nobody called Jesus. He was dead. Everybody's moping around about it. And the third day, he's out of the tomb walking around, talking to people. He had the power to do that. Let's look at this text, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, in its context of the book of John. John's prayer for us as he writes these words is that we might have faith in Jesus and follow through on that faith with our living and thereby have our salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus worked signs. Other signs Jesus did. He did, you know, a sign again is that which points to something. Miracles, signs, and wonders are three words that are often used in conjunction with one another in the New Testament. A miracle and a wonder, things that amaze, things that catch the attention, things that go beyond the realm of physical possibility, walking on the water, for example, raising the dead. Those things cannot happen according to the natural physical laws of the universe. But a sign is something which points to something. Jesus raised the widow's son at name, for example, turned the water into wine at Cana not just for the benefit of those things themselves, not just to bless that widow, but that was pointing to something. Here is a man who is not just a man. Here is somebody who has the power of God that came from God. At the end of his life, Jesus would say to his apostles, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And the miracles help us to see the Father as we look at the life of Jesus. So let's look through the book of John and see the few miracles. It's amazing when you look at it how few miracles John actually did record. The first one we might, might uh, look at is in John chapter 1, and many wouldn't even perhaps recognize this. 
as a miracle. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said, How do you know me? And Jesus said, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. That was clear across town. Jesus couldn't see through all the buildings. He didn't have that x-ray vision and around the corners and over the hills. How did he know that? He had the power to see beyond the physical universe in which we live. And also to recognize the quality of character that was in Nathaniel. There's a miracle involved in Jesus' greeting to Nathaniel. In verse number 49, Nathanael answered and said, You're the son of God. You're the son, of, you're the king of Israel. And Jesus said, Because I said I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You see, the miracle brought faith. Nathanael saw the miracle that was in Jesus' recognition of him, and Nathanael believed. That's what the miracles are for. These are written that ye might believe. Jesus commented on just how little it took to bring faith in him. I saw you in your picture. You're a righteous man. You know, in most of our neighbors, it really wouldn't take very much to produce faith. They just need to hear the words of Jesus. They need someone to come and tell them about Jesus. Philip went and brought Nathaniel. They need a Philip. Your neighbor needs a Philip. Bring him to Jesus. Jesus knows his heart. When people see Jesus, they very often believe. And yet there is so much more to Jesus. There is so much more in him that we can read. Look, he, Jesus continued to Nathaniel. You're going to see greater things than these. Nathaniel already believed just on the basis of that first encounter. And yet God was going to, uh, Jesus was going to increase his faith, deepen his faith by the more and more and more that he was going to see. In chapter 2 is the second one that I already referred to, turning the water into wine. Fill up the water pots with water and just bring them and show them. Jesus didn't touch him. He didn't speak over him. He didn't wave a magic wand over him. He just says, go fill them with water and take them over there. They filled them with water. They knew what they were getting. They were getting water. But when they got over there, it wasn't water. It was the finest wine. Now, I'm not going to take a whole long time on this about wine. But you need to understand that wine in the King James Version of the Bible is uh, always translated from a single Greek word, which if you looked at it and pronounced it, it would sound a little bit like wine, the English word. And it means a lot of things. It doesn't always mean, and almost never, frankly, means in the scriptures, uh, alcoholic beverage. It's any product of the grapevine. Uh, the grape itself, the pulp, the juice, uh, the grape. It, 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 it's just squeeze the grape. It, it can be fresh juice. It can be eating grapes. It can be a whole lot of things. The context has to determine. So they were drinking good, fresh grape juice didn't have to get sick on fermented uh, drink. His miracles manifested his glory, John tells us in verse 11, and his disciples believed on him. When they saw the miracle that Jesus did, they believed. <coughs> what will we do when we consider seriously Jesus, the man who worked such miracles? John continues in verse number 4. This is uh, that to which I already referred also the nobleman's, nobleman's son. Come and see my son. Come and heal my son. He's sick. And Jesus simply said, go your way. Your son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken and he went his way. He believed, okay, my son will live. I'm going, oh, I'm going to go home and I'm going to rejoice with my son. And the father knew that when he got home, he said, well, now, when, when uh, well, on the way home, he met some people, uh, and they said, oh, he's, he's okay. Well, when did that happen? And they told him, and he said, hmm, that was exactly the same time that Jesus told me that he was okay. And so what did he do? He himself believed and his whole house. When they knew that Jesus was the one who had that power 
and who effected that cure, he and his entire house believed. He started off believing the words of Jesus, but that apparently hadn't translated itself into any evaluation of the man Jesus himself. Many times people will look at the Bible and they'll take words out of it and say, oh, you know, uh, you shall believe the truth and the truth will make you free. Boy, how that passage has been perverted. Or God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. How that word has been, that verse has been misused. People believe the words they read in the Bible, but they don't sometimes believe him who spoke the words. But on this particular occasion... The nobleman first believed the words, and then he thought about it. He experienced more of the effect of those words, and he got together with his family, and they began to say, you know, that happened, and Jesus said it, and it was the same time, and they put it all together, and they believed in Jesus. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 7, Paul writes to Timothy that he ought to exercise himself to godliness. You know, faith grows with exercise. We've got to do more than just read the Word. Well, we've got to do more than just hear somebody talk about the Word. We actually have to read it for ourselves. Open the Bible and see. Now, if you do that and just let it fall at random, you'll probably be confused over what you're looking at. If you read through the first half or, or third of the Bible, you're going to think, what kind of a book is this? All this killing and slaughter. There was a reason for it. You may not see it as you read through it, but if you'll read the whole Bible and see the whole picture, you know, if you just look at the top 10 inches of that thing standing there, you're going to think, mm, you know, what's that? All? We don't need that in here. What's that all about? And then you see the whole picture. You see the, the tree and the lights and the ornaments and the gifts. You know, there's, a more, there's more to the story than just a little bit. Dig to the depths of what you're reading and see the whole picture of a thing. You ever work a jigsaw puzzle and you pick up a piece and you say, I'm not too sure about this. Do I want to work this puzzle? I don't even know what this is. See? But then you put the pieces together and you see the whole picture. Or you, you put it together because you see the picture on the box, right? And want to get there. But you wouldn't have started working that puzzle if you hadn't seen the whole picture in the first place. You're not going to understand Jesus or have any right relationship with him if you don't see the whole picture. So read the whole Bible. Get it all. And you'll find there's more here, when you exercise your faith, the man went, and he heard, and he considered, and he had faith. If you're not satisfied with your depth of faith, it can grow. Exercise it. If you're not satisfied with your arm strength, your tummy size, your back strength, or whatever. Exercise, and it gets stronger, right? The same is true of, I don't know, spelling, mathematics. History knowledge, geography, exercise it, study it, it grows stronger. And the same is true of your spiritual life. Exercise it, read it, put it into practice, talk about it with other people. Faith grows from hearing the word, from seeing Jesus. In John chapter 5, we come to the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus said to the man, just take up your bed and walk. And immediately he was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And uh, then we're told, you know, that was the Sabbath day. In verses 10 through 13, we see there was a whole multitude of people around here in that place. And some of them were approving what Jesus did, and some of them were disapproving because it was on the Sabbath day. Some looked at what he did, some looked at when he did it, and they drew their conclusions based on that. And when they condemned him for working on the Sabbath day, it was because they had the wrong idea of the Sabbath day in the first place. They started off with the wrong framework, the wrong foundation. But notice in verse number 14, Jesus didn't just save a soul and go on his way. Afterward, Jesus found the man in the temple, and he said to him, You're made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come on you. Jesus kept on teaching and encouraging the young man who had faith. We don't just baptize somebody into Christ and go off and forget them. You know, sometimes people accuse us of preaching, well, water salvation. You just want to get everybody in the water. That's not what we're looking for at all. We're looking for souls who want to glorify God and receive the blessings of God. 
Who's going to do that? People who know who God is. How are we going to know that? Knowing who Jesus is. How are we going to know that? Reading the book about his deeds and his actions. I mean, his deeds and his words. Learn who Jesus is. We know who God is. And we can find that benefit. Well, we know about the feeding of the 5,000 recorded in John chapter 6, <clears throat> the, the uh, fifth miracle that John records. And uh, he uh, tells us about the young man with the five barley loaves and the two small fish, and they divided it, and you know the story. And verse number 14 tells us that uh, when people had seen that miracle that Jesus did, they said, what? They said, this is truly that prophet who should come into the world. And again, they're referring to that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15 that I mentioned before. Moses had said that the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. And then when we come to uh, Matthew chapter 15, we see Jesus and Moses standing there together. That's another miracle. John didn't record that one. But we see Jesus and Moses standing there together, the voice out of heaven. God says, now listen to Jesus. Not to Moses any longer, but listen to Jesus. And so uh, the fulfillment again of what Moses was saying here. Remember that Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, you're going to die in your sins if you don't believe that I am the one. And so when they fought on that miracle, they came to this conclusion just as Nicodemus did. We know that you're a teacher come from God because nobody can do the things that you do unless God is with him. It's really sad when people don't believe an eyewitness. Did you ever come in from being out somewhere and he said, you won't believe what I saw. <laughs> and lo and behold, they don't. <laughs> you know, you try to tell somebody, I saw this amazing thing. Now, I don't know about a, a crazy car wreck or it might have been the hugest flock of geese you ever saw or, or whatever. I ah, just tell them. You know, I saw 12 robins in my backyard this morning. Now, this ain't the time for robins. You didn't see that. And you know, you, whatever it is, isn't it frustrating to tell somebody what you saw, what you heard, what you read, what you learned, what you know, and they don't believe you. Nicodemus said, we see the words, the works that you're doing, we're drawing the conclusion, and we believe and we know that you are the Son of God. We have throughout the New Testament the record of eyewitnesses. John is telling us about some of the miracles that Jesus did. Are we going to read these miracles and believe them or just close the Bible and say, that can't happen. People don't walk on the water. No, that's right. People don't. People don't rise from the dead. That's right. People don't. Jesus did. That's what makes this whole assembly this morning sensible. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, walk on the water, and do all these other things, it's foolish for us even to be here in his name. He's no better than you and I. We should not be praising his name at all. But the fact is, he did these things, and the record is abundant, showing all of this, uh, all of these miracles, and so many more. In John chapter 9, we read of the man who had been born blind, and he's over 40 years old, and Jesus comes and gives him sight. In verse number 38 of that chapter, the man said, Lord, I believe. He didn't come to Jesus seeing until after he believed and obeyed what Jesus told him to do. And just like the nobleman a while ago, he believed the words. The nobleman started to go home. Okay, my son's well, and he started to go home. The blind man said, okay, I believe it if I go do this. So he went to do that, and then he came back seeing. Now he can see because he obeyed, and then he comes and says to Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. When we put God's Word to the test in our own life, when we read that the book says, if you'll do this, and we get up and go do it, we come back and the Word says, if you do this, you get that. We were talking in a Bible class this morning about the book of Revelation. And uh, all through the first two chapters, uh, 
the second and third chapters, it tells us, you know, if you overcome, I'll give you this. I'll bless you with that. And at the end of the book we were reading this morning, it says, he who overcomes, I'll give him all these things. Why don't we just try to conquer sin in our lives and live for Jesus? Let him be our motivation. Let him be the rule of our life. In verses uh, 35 through 37, well, let's go to this verse. Let's go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 16. Just take note of the fact that not all have obeyed the gospel. Isaiah says, the Lord who has believed our report, there will always be people in this world who will not believe even the eyewitnesses. They will not believe the book that has been proven true through many, many tests over the years. Go back in John chapter 9, verse 37, uh, 35. Jesus heard that they had cast a man out of the temple, and when he had found him, he said, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And, he said, and uh, Jesus said, You've both seen him, and it is he who talks to you. The miracle didn't save the man. The miracle didn't make him uh, a believer uh, part of the family of God, it was his obedience to the word that Jesus gave. And the miracle simply convinced him of who it was that gave that word. When we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and do what he says, we're going to rightly receive the promise that God gave to all who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and just do what he says. It's really that Simple. All oh, the details are many, and the details aren't uh, always easy to, to manipulate in a given life. But the principle is that simple. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and just do what He says. Put God to the test, and find out that those who walk in the light are the people who have fellowship with those others who are walking in the light, trusting in God, and finding the hope of eternal life. Well, let's come to the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Jesus cried in a loud voice, Come forth! And he who was dead came forth. Lazarus came out of the tomb. I mentioned a while ago Hebrews uh, chapters 1 and 2. Remember again in verse number 3 of chapter 1. Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God, the express image of his person. We know what God looks like. Look at Jesus. That's what God looks like. Well, we don't have a picture of Jesus. We don't know for sure. All these things that, you know, we see a picture, we recognize Jesus. Well, that's just some uh, medieval artwork. Uh, we don't really know what Jesus looked like. There's no paintings made of him or photographs taken uh, when he was here. So we really don't know. In fact, Isaiah says he wasn't a pretty man. There's nothing special about him that draws our attention to him. But we look at his character. We look at his words. And he is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. And he purged our sins, and he sat down on the right hand of God himself in heaven. That's who Jesus is. And so that word of his power that he spoke at the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out. And the... Uh, you know, the, the background leading up to that, uh, that, he had heard that Lazarus was sick, and his disciples said, well, let's go. And he said, let's just wait a while. And they said, well, you know, what, what are we waiting for? And Jesus said, because this sickness is to the glory of God. What did all of that mean? When we read what happened when he finally came after Lazarus died, and Jesus prayed to the Father before he called Lazarus, and he said, Lord, Father, I know that you hear me always, but I'm speaking so that these others around will hear and believe that you sent me. And when they saw what he did, when they saw Lazarus come out of the tomb, the scripture says that many of the Jews believed in Jesus. They saw the miracles. It convinced them that this man is the Son of God. Jesus has the power to raise the dead. He has the power to save men's souls from hell. 
but we're only saved from hell if we will come to him and obey him. In the 12th chapter, in the follow-up of this event, many of the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Many of the Jews were right to hear the evidence, to see the evidence, and to believe the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. The rulers, the people who should have been expert in the Word, spiritually minded, looking for the fulfillment of the prophecies, all they wanted to do was kill Jesus. <laughs> and then they wanted to kill the evidence so that nobody else could come to believe. You wonder, how could people be that wicked? We've got them around us every day. Many of us live around them, work with them all the time. Some of us live in the homes with people who are just like this. They just want to kill the evidence. Oh, they may, they may not want to be burning Bibles. They may not even argue a whole lot. But they kill the evidence simply by refusing to listen to it. A member of the church one time told me, that's enough, Al, I don't want to hear anymore. How sad that is. But some among us could be the same way. Are we going to listen to the evidence? These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Well, come then to that 20th chapter of John. And on the first day of the week after his crucifixion, they went and found the tomb empty. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, buried in a tomb, sealed with a Roman seal, and opened that tomb and came out on the third day. He wasn't there anymore. Jesus himself had said, as recorded by John, back in um, the 10th chapter in verse 18, it's my life, and I've got power to lay it down, and I've got the power to take it up again. That's one thing to say when you're walking around talking to people. but when they see that he actually did it. You know, when he was on the cross, some of the mockers cried out, if he's the son of God, let him come down from the cross. Then we'll believe. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> All the miracles that he did, they hadn't believed yet. Why would one more make any difference? How many miracles would it take you to believe that Jesus is the son of God? I suspect none. But you believe that already. There were people who were determined to destroy him. And even to destroy the evidence and the record of his having proved his identity. <clears throat> we come to verse 24. Jesus on that night of his resurrection had come into the assembly of the disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. We don't know why. We, we hear a lot of sermons sometimes condemning Thomas for not being in the assembly. I, I don't know that he was to be condemned. I don't know where he was or what. It's certainly right to consider what he missed <laughs> by not being there. And Jesus isn't going to be in our next assembly. Not personally, physically, in the flesh. But the blessings of God will be if we come together in the name of Jesus to worship God in spirit and truth. What will you miss by not being a part of that? But the point here is that Thomas wasn't there, and he said, I'm not going to believe unless I can touch the nail prints in his hands and thrust my hand and decide where the spear went. I'm not going to believe until I see the physical evidence. Well, you and I aren't going to see the physical evidence. We're never going to be able to put our hands on the nail prints in Jesus' hand. Thrust our hand into his side. Not going to happen. He's not going to be here. But can we believe the eyewitness evidence of one who did that? Of a skeptic? Who said, I'm not going to believe until I can see that. And so the next week, Jesus said, Thomas, come and look. Thomas put his fingers in the nail prints. And Thomas thrust his hand into the side of Jesus. And the scripture says, Thomas answered and said, My Lord, my God. What conclusions can you draw from the evidence?
John told us what the eyewitnesses there had seen and what they had said, and then John gave us his own record. Of course, he was there. He was one of the apostles. But he added this in the 24th verse of the 21st chapter. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John said, I was there, and I saw it. He wrote the same thing again in what we refer to as 1 John, chapter 1, and the first four verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon in our hands of handle, of the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Manifested means shown, declared, displayed, openly. That which we have seen, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son Jesus Christ. These things are right unto you that your joy might be full. Are you full of joy at the knowledge that God has sent His only begotten Son into this world to pay the price for your sins, proving the power of His identity, and giving you the hope of eternal life in heaven? Is it evidence or is it prejudice that denies the eyewitness testimony? Do we reject this because... The evidence proves they were wrong. There is no such evidence. It's only prejudice that denies or rejects this testimony. Jesus spoke to us words of good news. He gave us signs that prove the truth of the words that he spoke. Back in the 12th chapter of John, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet believed, they believed him not that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should be Some people are willfully blind. They just don't want to see. John's record continued. Jesus' words continued. <clears throat> These things said Isaiah, Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus spiritually. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And there will be many today will consider the evidence, put it out of their minds, because if I accept this, I'm going to lose the praise of men. People are going to mock me. They're going to kick me out of their fellowships, their clubs, their associations. Some people might lose their jobs by believing in Jesus and living for him. Many would not believe in that day. It's been true ever since. It's still true today. Others believe, but they would not confess it. That's been true ever since. It's still true today. But Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. If he would come down from the cross, we'd believe it. That would be easy, wouldn't it? Nobody ever did that before. Imagine just Jesus just standing there with him. Okay, now, now do you believe? We might think that would be easy, but the blessings come to those who believe that he's the Christ even though he didn't come down from the cross. Look at the evidence. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in His name. All you need to do is believe that He's the Son of God. Believe that His words are true and just obey. Turn away from sin, that is anything other than what Jesus 
as required. Stop living without Jesus and start living with Jesus and for Jesus. Confess your faith in Him. Be eager to say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John, Acts 8 and verse 37. And be buried in the waters of baptism with Him, putting to death your old man of sin and rising to walk in newness of life. Because it is a new life altogether. Washed free from sin. When you walk with Jesus Christ. If you need to, while we stand and sing, won't you come to Jesus Christ?